It's wonderful to see a, a great group of people out here. Uh, our bishop this evening will, will lead us in prayer after I introduce him. But I, I will say that he comes from California, uh, from the diocese where I grew up. Now, I didn't know him back then, and he wasn't the bishop back then, and I wasn't a Catholic back then. You know, see how the Lord brings all things to, to good for those who love him. Um, our speaker this evening was born in Lincoln, Nebraska in 1951. After obtaining his Bachelor's of Arts degree from St. Thomas Seminary College in Denver, Bishop Vasha obtained a Master's of Divinity from Holy Trinity Seminary of the University of Dallas. He was ordained to the Holy Priesthood in 1976 when I was one year old <laughs> in Lincoln, Nebraska and subsequently spent two years pursuing postgraduate studies in canon law at the Gregorian University in Rome. After serving in several capacities for the Diocese of Lincoln, he was ordained to the Episcopate in January of 2012 in Baker, Oregon. Bishop Vasha was appointed coadjutor Bishop of Santa Rosa, California in 2010 and succeeded uh, to be bishop there in 2011. We are very blessed to welcome a wonderfully, wonderfully faithful bishop who is also very difficult to convince to come and speak at the Institute of <laughs> Catholic Culture. Please join me in welcoming Bishop Vasha. Yeah, leave, leave, leave him here. We'll begin with the prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. and then come, O Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth your Spirit, O Lord, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who by the light of thy Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful. Grant that in that same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolations through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of Good Counsel, Pray for us. in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I, I'm s sounding like it's echoing back into my ear. Is that a problem for you? And if it isn't, it is a problem for me. Maybe I need to move out of the... It's a delight to be with you this evening and have the opportunity to talk with you. And uh, I do appreciate the efforts of Deacon Sabatino, who has been really bugging me for a couple of years. <laughs> and perhaps after tonight, you'll say, why did you bother? Certainly, I appreciate the, the efforts that he has put forth in you know, helping to coordinate and gather a body of folks together for uh, this Institute of Catholic Culture, because it is this kind of gathering which can and really ought to be the spirit of the Second Vatican Council. We have so many rumors about what the Second Vatican Council was supposed to do, and I would tell you that this is what it was. This kind of engagement of the laity, this kind of interest, this kind of participation in the faith life of the church. And so I commend Deacon Sabatino and, and all of you for your participation in this particular apostolate. And it is an important apostolate, the Apostolate of Education, Catechesis. I have tonight the possibility of four or five different talks. <laughs> I never know from one day to the next which talk you're going to get. Um, certainly, I, I am aware of the efforts of the 
Diocese of Arlington and Bishop Loverdi and his insistence on an Orthodox presbyterate and orthodoxy in even Catholic schools and an insistence or a recommendation or a movement to say, you know, we have to have some kind of criteria and qualification for teaching in our catechetical programs and in our Catholic schools. What a novel concept, huh? <laughs> that those who are charged with the duty of teaching the Catholic faith actually be asked whether or not they believe what they teach or know what they teach. Yeah. It is the role of a bishop, in my view, to do that. And so I did something similar in Baker. And I, perhaps the, the response in Baker is you know, a little different than maybe Arlington. Uh, it's a different culture, a different climate. And Santa Rosa, I'm presently doing something comparable again. And the insistence, though it could be couched in a variety of different ways, really redounds to this. That I have a desire for the teachers in my Catholic schools and in my catechetical programs to more fully understand and appreciate the beautiful and rich teachings of the Catholic Church. To appreciate the beautiful and rich teachings of the faith. And the teaching of that faith is really one of their primary goals and responsibilities which is entrusted to them. So even though there is some questioning about by what right do you, Bishop, have to question us about our Catholic faith, it is nothing less than my duty and responsibility. If I don't do that, then I'm negligent. And I try not to be negligent, though in trying not to be negligent, I probably flounder along in ways which I should not. And so my message to the diocese, my message to you who, who gather, and what I hope to perhaps help with a little bit tonight is to foster that deeper appreciation for the richness and beauty of the teachings of the Holy Catholic Church. And I believe that you have gathered here precisely because you do have a love and appreciation for that faith and that you want to deepen your knowledge of and deepening your knowledge to deepen your love of that faith of which you are a part and which is so much a part of you. And I want to use as my central theme, and I'll repeat this a dozen times in the course of this talk because repetition is a good way to make sure that you have at least one message riveted in your brain. And it's from Evangelii Nunciandi by Pope uh, Paul VI, his encyclical on evangelization. And he writes this, modern man listens more willingly to witnesses than to teachers. And if he does listen to teachers, it is because they are witnesses. Yeah. And so you are witnesses to the faith. And you must first be witnesses to the faith if you are to be, as you hope to be, effective teachers of the faith. Now, the role of the Catholic lady in the church was a major theme of the Second Vatican Council. Not the only theme by any stretch of the imagination, but certainly a major theme. And in Lumen Gentium, we read this. And I would propose to you that this paragraph, paragraph 31 of Lumen Gentium, is in many ways the heart of the lay apostolate. That document says, of you. They live in the world, that is, in each and in all of the secular professions and occupations. They live in the ordinary circumstances of family and social life from which the very web of their existence is woven. What a beautiful image of you out there in the world and, and encountering all of the different elements of our society engaged in every aspect of it. They are called there by God, that by exercising their proper function and led by the spirit of the gospel, they may work for the sanctification of the world from within as a leaven. 
from within the context of your lives and the social situations in which you find yourselves. In this way, they, you, make Christ known to others. And here's a beautiful line. Especially by the testimony of a life resplendent in faith, hope, and charity. Now, these lines are not written about bishops, priests, or religious. They're written as a call to holiness for every single one of us. And for the laity as engaged in that secular society to be salt, light, and leaven to provide for the sanctification of the world from within. And to do that by the example of a life. Now, I don't know about you, um, but I don't necessarily wake up in the morning and look at myself in the mirror and say, now there's a person resplendent in faith, hope, and charity. <laughs> I gauge from your reaction, it's not you either. <laughs> but that's the vision that the council holds out for the church. That's a vision of a light set on a lampstand that gives light to all in the house. A life resplendent in faith, hope, and charity. See, this is the freedom and the call that your baptismal commitment gives to you and commands of you. It is not to do what priests do or religious do or what bishops do or even to try to imitate them, but rather to be holy in the context of your own lives. I suspect most of you look at the immense power of the laity in our American culture. And even though it is necessary that you look to bishops and you look to priests and you look to religious to somehow engage this culture, to engage politics, to engage politicians, to engage lobbyists, to engage senators and legislators of one type or another, and say, Bishop, you should be out there meeting those people. And I keep saying to people, no, that's your job. You have to be out there, because if he talks to me, it's one person. If he talks to you, there's a possibility of 64 million others. And even if all of the bishops talk to them, that's still only about 250 bishops. Not really a tremendously large constituency but you as the people of God and say, we represent this body of people, the people of God, this Catholic church, and we are striving to live lives resplendent in faith, hope, and charity, deeply committed to the gospel and to all that the gospel entails, then you will be listened to. Then that leaven is spread out throughout the whole community. It's mixed through that whole mass of dough. And then it can have its leavening effect. We sometimes think that the, the measure of how well we have implemented the Second Vatican Council and this may sound a little critical, but it's not intended to be critical at all, rather an observation. We tend to measure the effectiveness of parishes, perhaps, and even judge them to say, well, that's a Second Vatican Council type of parish, and that one isn't. But the measure is based on how many lay people are in the sanctuary. Yeah. How many roles and duties are fulfilled in the sanctuary by lay persons? But that's a really a very poor measure. Because I don't think the council says, listen, your role, your job is to sanctify the world from the sanctuary. But rather to live in the context of your lives and from that context, consecrate and sanctify the world. 
by the witness of your lives. And yes, we need volunteers in the parish. We need people who are catechists and teachers in our Catholic schools. We need people who are readers at Mass and extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion. We need those people who help with the sacristan duties and all of those necessary duties. But in a parish of two or 3,000 families, you can't have 6,000 volunteers. It's a very small percentage of the people who are engaged in that. A very small number. And even if in a parish had 250 volunteers in the litur liturgical ministries, and that would be a lot, it still is not a measure of how well that parish is influencing the society in which it lives. Because you have the role, the duty, the responsibility of making the world a holier place. The world is your sanctuary. And if we look at where the world has gone in the last 40 years, I don't know if I'm myopic, but I don't know that I would say it's a much holier world today than it was 40 years ago. I don't see signs of that in our society. And we all have to look at ourselves and say, you know what? I have a part in that. That's my mission field that is not being evangelized. That's my duty and responsibility, the world. That's where I'm called to be witness and evangelizer and sanctifier. Now, the sanctuary ought to be that place, yes, where people gather and where that impetus of sanctity is honed and fostered so that it can go. And those are the last words of Mass. Go, the Mass is ended. Go to your proper role, your proper mission, your proper evangelizing field. Go. Don't just hang around the sanctuary. That's a great place to be. Yeah, it's wonderful. And for pastors, I would challenge you, you know, it is a lot easier to get volunteers to work in the parish than it is to foster that apostolate of people going out from the parish. That takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of pushing. But just as we invite people, come, yeah, and we have to do that actively and invitingly, so also we kind of have to turn around and push people out the door. As a sign on the door of the church on, on exiting says, you are now entering the mission field. <laughs> yeah, as they go out the door. We have to have a sense that that's our duty and our responsibility. No one lights a lamp. We light lamps in the church. Lamps of faith and we enkindle that deep desire and longing for the gospel. No one lights a lamp and then goes home and puts it under a bushel basket. But in large ways we've done that too long and too often over the last 40 years. We haven't allowed that light to shine. Now, that does not in any way demean the important and necessary work of fostering a deeper liturgical life in a parish, a deeper catechetical life, a deeper spiritual life. But that's not the end or the goal. That's a means to the missionary action of the church in order that it might enable you as the laity to more properly fu to fulfill your baptismal commission to go out into the whole world and proclaim the gospel, especially by the testimony of a life resplendent in faith, hope, and charity. There is a, a field of study um, in, in the church, and you all know about it. You have apologetics. Right? Now, when we talk about apologetics, you know, of course, that that is that training or teaching about how to defend the faith against those who question the faith or attack it sort of the logical underpinnings, the scriptural underpinnings of the faith, the argumentation for the defense of the faith. And that's certainly necessary, and we have to be well-versed in that. 
But I think what we have, at least what I've experienced somewhat in California, and maybe it's not the same out here, is that instead of an apologetic faith, we tend to be an apologizing faith. And, and think about this. You know, how many people almost hold out to the, the definition of parishes as friendly to certain aberrations? You know, and treat our Catholic parishes, which are faithful to the magisterium, as somehow being exclusive or restrictive or unfriendly or unwelcoming. And it goes something like this. Christians, almost with bowed heads and wringing hands, you know, apologetically saying, I really believe in the beauty of my Catholic Church, and I know that the teachings of the Church about abortion, contraception, social justice, homosexual marriage, embryonic stem cell research, celibacy, divorce, and the need to attend Mass are burdensome. I know those are difficult. <laughs> but don't worry, this does, this does not really matter because the Church is so significant, and this is only the Church's teaching now. So come join us, because there's so many good things in the Church that it justifies all of these difficulties. It's an apologizing kind of modality, isn't it? See, that's not appealing. It's not appealing. But that kind of approach also says we don't appreciate the real beauty of our Catholic faith. And so we need to know our faith, understand our faith more deeply, so that we are convinced that everything that the church teaches is part and parcel of the good news itself. Do you know that the church's teaching about the evil of contraception and abortion is the good news? Do we believe that? Do we hold that? Do we affirm that in a positive kind of joyful way? Yeah, we're sort of like, well, you know, that's what the church teaches, and we're sort of apologetic for it instead of being apologetic about it. Because we cannot separate the good news which the church teaches from what she teaches. The good news is not different than that. That is the good news. How often have we seen the church's beautiful teaching about the need to respect and honor the dignity of marriage under attack in a variety of states? You know, it's represented as some kind of mean-spirited and arbitrary desire to deprive homosexually inclined persons of the joys of relationship. Yeah? And, and we sort of accept that. Well, yeah, you know, that's, that's too bad that that's the way the church is. You know, perhaps even we ourselves have some sort of conflict to say, you know what, I, I'm really fearful about really upholding that because society says it's mean-spirited and restrictive and I certainly don't want to be judged as mean-spirited or restrictive by that secular society. See, do we really believe that the church's message about marriage is good news? Right? And if we don't hold that in the depth of our hearts, we're not going to manifest it because even if it was a light in our lives, it's under a bushel basket, not giving light to all in the house. A significant number of Catholics, I believe, rather than living lives resplendent in faith, hope, and charity, stand with our secular culture in calling for the establishment of a different sexual ethic a different life ethic, a different ascetical ethic. They fail to recognize that what the church teaches about the beauty and dignity of sexuality is good news. They fail to recognize that what the church teaches about the beauty and dignity of human life is good news. And thus, the profound need to have reverence for life at all stages, that that likewise is good news. They fail to recognize that disciplining and mortifying our temporal desires for the sake of the kingdom of God is the path to the acquisition of the ultimate and unconditional love, truth, goodness, beauty, being which we so desperately crave and long for. See, 
these very teachings are the good news. It is indeed good news that we no longer need be oppressed or dominated by these inclinations to evil, but that we are set free of them by the sacrificial, redemptive actions of our Lord. And we pronounce this at, at every Mass in some form. Lord, by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. You are the Savior of the world. Freedom from what? Freedom from sin. Freedom from the sense that we need abortion, contraception, homosexual marriage, embryonic stem cell research in order to achieve the love, truth, goodness, beauty, being that we long for. See, the message of the church is no. We're greater than that. We're beyond that. We ambition for so much more for our people than that. Right? We're not limited by the church. We're limited by our society. In 1993, blessed and soon to be Saint uh, John Paul II wrote what I consider to be a, a wonderfully beautiful and powerful encyclical Veritatis Splendor. And you could do a whole six-week series on Veritatis Splendor alone. It would be a wonderful presentation for the Institute of Catholic Culture if you have someone qualified to, to teach it. And just go through Veritatis Splendor beginning to end. In there, the Holy Father really points to a problem in, in our society. And to me, it, it's prescient. You know, it's 20 years ago already. He writes, today, however it seems necessary to reflect on the whole of the church's moral teaching with the precise goal of recalling certain fundamental truths of Catholic doctrine which in the present sac circumstances risk being distorted or denied. In fact, he says, a new situation has come about within the Christian community itself. And perhaps you experience this in terms of some of your fellow Catholics. Ha has experienced the spread of numerous doubts and objections of a human and psychological, social and cultural, religious and even properly theological nature with regard to the church's moral teachings. And then he writes, it is no longer a matter of limited and occasional dissent, but an overall and systematic calling into question of traditional moral doctrine on the basis of certain anthropological and ethical presuppositions. At the root of these presuppositions is the more or less obvious influence of currents of thought, which end by detaching human freedom from its essential and con constitutive relationship to truth. Freedom detached from truth looks like freedom, but it's slavery. And we have a world which is living in a horrible slavery, which is in need again of the light of the gospel so that people might be delivered from the slavery which they are freely choosing because they think it's freedom. But in choosing it, in choosing all of those things that society says these are good for you, they're really choosing things which are beneath their human dignity, far beneath what God ambitions for us, far beneath who we are as sons and daughters of God, as creatures of God. I propose that the diminutive view of mankind which society possesses and which it offers to man, which is attractive, really further demeans the human person, you know, further demeans the meaning and sanctity of marriage, further demeans the meaning and sanctity of life itself further demeans even the, the, the nature of relationship. And so a portion of what I'm going to do in the diocese is a series of, of teachings, and one of the hours will be on an instruction on those commandments which touch and refer to the relationship to human life. And then another series on those Catholic moral teachings 
which touch on the nature of relationships and why the church is interested in those teachings based on, on the commandments. What is it about the church's teaching that is good for us and necessary for us to hear? You know, it's interesting, there's been a, a lot of attention given to the uh, September interview of Pope Francis, uh, in which he called for a more pastoral approach to those who accepted the diminished view of man. And he really proposes that those diminished view of, of those diminished views of man are really represented by a variety of societal ills. Now, interestingly, he referred to us and to all who are challenged by the teachings of the church as people who are wounded. Yeah? And so we know we're all wounded. We're wounded by sin. We're wounded by our attachments. We're wounded by our past. We're wounded by our present. We're wounded by our fears. We're wounded by our failure to have as good a relationship with God as we know we need to have, or at least that we should have. We're wounded by our relationships or failure to have proper relationships with spouses and children. We're wounded. Right? The Holy Father points that out. We're all wounded. Thus he says, though not directly, but this is clearly implied in his words, that the homosexually active man, the post-abortive woman, the contracepting couple, the pornography addicted youth, the divorced and remarried Catholic are all included in that general description of those who are wounded. And we have to look at that and say, yes, they are wounded. They're wounded ultimately by sin. They and we are wounded. But the world would like us to think that we're somehow wounded by Christ or wounded by the church or wounded by the cross, but we're not wounded by that at all. We're wounded by the very rejection of the cross. The Holy Father affirms as much by mentioning the need for confession and thus conversion. Unfortunately, those who are variously afflicted want the physician, in this case the church, and this is, this is the irony of this. They want the church to declare that they are not wounded and that they are not in need of healing. Isn't that what the claim is? That somehow the Holy Father was saying, no, he's telling us we're not wounded. No, he's saying precisely the opposite. We are all wounded, some wounded more seriously than others. The Holy Father even then compared the church to a field hospital. What a great example. But those brought to a field hospital are not the healthy and spiritually fit, but the sick and the wounded. In fact, those who are seriously sick and seriously wounded. And so he says, they come to this field hospital. Now, the allusion to the ills of our society being a kind of serious illness, which the church is called upon to heal, seems to have escaped the consciousness of most, if not all, the commentators. <laughs> the secular media would have us believe that the Holy Father said that the church need no longer look at herself as a field hospital, because all those that we thought were wounded are not really wounded at all. In fact, they're all quite healthy. Thank you very much. No, if some would, as, if it was as some would have us believe, the Holy Father uh, would have declared that we're not wounded, and then the reference to the church as a field hospital is absolutely inane. Makes absolutely no sense. I agree with the Holy Father. The church needs to be a field hospital. And I would add that the lay faithful, all of you, all of us, despite our own woundedness, need to be so resplendent in faith, hope, and charity, so resplendent in joy and peace, so resplendent in goodness and holiness as to constitute a bright beacon shining the light and love of Christ in such a way that the woundedness of our entire culture is revealed, indeed exposed, so that those afflicted might seek and find mercy and healing that mercy and healing which is so desperately needed by them because they are wounded. Yet mercy without truth redounds to a type of false compassion. And so those who claim the Holy Father was calling for mercy without truth, that cannot be the case. 
Because mercy cannot exist without truth. It's a false compassion. Now, the Holy Father makes this very, very clear in his own words, um, so that those who accuse him of dismissing the moral code or the commandments as some kind of small-minded set of rules are, are not hearing what he said. Because he did say, um, pointing out critically to those pastors who are whom he describes in his own uh, inimitable way as loose ministers, you know? The loose minister washes his hands by simply saying, this is not a sin, or something like that. Uh, he's very critical of that. He says, no, that's not mercy. That's not compassion. That's not what the physician does when a sick person comes to him, right? Telling the seriously wounded soul who has come to the ecclesial field hospital that he is not really injured at all deprives that soul of both the truth and the possibility of healing. At the same time, and I think this too is consistent with the mind of Pope Francis, announcing and declaring to all the seriously wounded that they are hopelessly wounded and thus turning them away at the emergency room door does not at all foster the type of welcome that he envisioned. So neither condemning them nor declaring them free of ills, but rather meeting them and letting them know we have a message for you that is important and necessary and that you need to hear. A message that is good for you, joyful, fulfilling, enriching, a message consistent with who you are and who you know yourself to be as a child of God with a desire for ultimate and unconditional love, truth, goodness, beauty, being. We crave that, we desire that, the church offers it to you. Deacon Zapatino was supposed to hold up a sign with five minutes on it at this moment, but he didn't do that. But I'm going to go out. It'll be another ten minutes, and then I will be done, I think. Uh, at this point, kind of laid out a, a, a global scene, hopefully a, a little bit, and generated some, some thoughts. But I'm a huge proponent of a strong use of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And it's a necessary document for all of us to read and study, ponder and contemplate. I'm presently involved in an apostolate uh, in the Diocese of Santa Rosa on Wednesday morning from 7 to 8. I meet at the Chancery Office with whatever men in the community want to come to the Chancery at 7. And we're just going through the catechism paragraph by paragraph. We're on about paragraph 400. I have a group of 15 to 12 to 15 men who come every Wednesday morning, except when I'm not there. And they're faithfully there. And it's a little interaction. We just go through the catechism, we talk about it. And I wax eloquently, as only I can, about different paragraphs <laughs> of the catechism and challenge them somewhat. And I pick out different phrases. And the Catechism talks about sin in this way. Sin is present in human history. Any attempt to ignore it or to give this dark reality other names would be futile. To try to understand what sin is, one must first recognize the profound relation of man to God. For only in this relationship is the evil of sin unmasked in its true identity as humanity's rejection of God and opposition to him, even as it continues to weigh heavy on human life and history. To try to understand what sin is, one must first recognize the profound relation of man to God. This obviously requires an acceptance of the existence of God of his creative activity in our lives. And it allows for a, a discussion of God's act of creation. And it is that act of creating us, the moment of our beginning, that is the basis of our recognition of that profound relationship to God. Now, do we know what it means to say, God made me? 
I don't know if, if you are involved in any kind of project, but when you make something, I, I made some muffins the other day. I felt pretty good about them. <laughs> It's not much. <laughs> but we take joy and delight in those things which you make, in which your creative energies enter into. God makes us out of nothing. He likes us. He loves us. He cares for us. Consider these three brief passages from the Catechism regarding creation. And I do this for creation's sake but also for the sake of recognizing that the Catechism has some passages in it scattered throughout that we need to reflect on and be enriched by. Consider this, paragraph 356. Of all visible creatures, all visible creatures, the entire universe. Now, someone was saying the other day that, uh, that there are potentially 8 billion planets of a quasi-earthly type of composition in the universe. And that's only a small percentage of the total number of spherical bodies in the universe. Tens of billions of them. Right? That's a lot. We'll talk about that later. Man is the only creature able to know and love his creator. The only being in that material universe, hundreds of millions, billions of solar systems, and only we, out of all of that, are capable of knowing and loving our Creator. And more importantly, He is the only creature on earth, and really the only creature in the entire universe that God has willed for its own sake. Imagine, every one of us needs to reflect on what is that? God made you individually, personally, for your own sake. Not for anybody else, but for you. Because he prizes and treasures you. See, I think that's a message the world needs to hear. Do you know how unique and wonderful you are? Do you have any sense of what it means to be a creature of God? We don't. The Catechism gives us a hint that man, God has willed man for his own sake. And he alone is called to share by knowledge and love in God's own life. The whole material universe. It was for this that he was created. And this is the fundamental reason for his dignity. Do we know how great God ambitions for us? How much he desires for us? We could give a whole talk, as I gave a half hour talk on two words, for and from. <laughs> You know, we sometimes look at God and we look at these commandments and say, God didn't demand so much from us. He's so burdensome. It's so heavy. All of these moral tenets that we have to uphold. No. Don't we know that God wants so much for us? And because he ambitions so much for us, he does ask us, listen, in order to live up to that dignity, here's what you, here's what you need to do. This is important. Paragraph 357 continues. Being in the image of God, the human individual possesses the dignity of a person. And this is a splendid line. The dignity of a person who is not just something, but someone. I told the teachers, I said, don't you think your 7th and 8th graders, your freshmen and sophomores, at some point need to be pulled aside and say, don't you know that you're not something? You are someone. Do you know that? Do you know what that means? To be someone? Hey, this is our church. You're not an object of someone else's pleasure or gratification. You're not an object. You're not a machine. You're a person. 
You're someone. And even if a person has an inordinate affection for animals, right? And they may name their animal George. And that animal George may get outside. And a friend may be visiting. You know, and they hear a scratch at the door, and they go to the door and say, who's there? And they will say, no one. Because even though their dog is named George, and they may treat him like a person, they know it's a something, not a someone. Right? And no one going into the store says, well, I've left George out in the car. He's only three, but he'll be fine. <laughs> oh, it's not a someone, it's a something. Man is the only creature composed of body and spirit, soul, who is not something, but someone. He is capable of self-knowledge, of self-possession, and of freely giving himself and entering into communion with other persons. See, we in the Catholic Church want the very best for what, very best for who we are, because we have such a high vision of the dignity of mankind. And we will not brook a lowering of that standard and allowing society or culture to treat us as if we are any less than that. And so we hold fast to that. Not because it damages or hurts the human person, but because we so highly value and esteem the human person. A someone created by God. Paragraph 364. Through his very bodily condition, he sums up in himself the elements of the material world. Through him, they are thus brought to their highest perfection and can raise their voice in praise freely given to the Creator. Now, what does that mean? Of all the billions of planets and billions of solar systems, this material body, right, you and me, is the only element of that creation, that material creation, which can give voice in an intelligible, for the most part, you know, and concentrated way to raise a voice of praise to the God who made us. And so you kind of imagine all of creation, all of that material universe, kind of coming together with this longing and urge and desire to say, we want to give praise to God, but we have no voice. And we stand and say, but we, of all of the created universe, have been given power to give voice to that hymn of praise which all of silent nature cries out to give to God. The Catechism cites the book of Daniel, chapter 3. And you know Daniel's hymn of praise is a part of the Liturgy of the Hours, and it goes through this whole litany of sun and moon, bless the Lord, stars and seas, bless the Lord, rivers and mountains, bless the Lord, fish and dolphins and water creatures, bless the Lord, birds of the air, bless the Lord. You know, it goes through this whole, if we read that, and recognize that Daniel is giving voice to what we are called to give voice to every day. To recognize the wonderful position that we have in this created universe. To be privileged to be the ones who give praise to God. Wow. What an awesome power. What an awesome responsibility. What an awesome gift. We stand, hopefully, humbly before that gift and say, praise God, who is so good to us, who has given us so much, and who calls upon us to give this praise and worship to God. I also, in reflecting on, on the universe and its greatness, um, you know, science says, well, we, ha we have to find a reason for all of it. You know, there must be other living creatures, other life forms on other planets, because otherwise it's just a whole bunch of empty space. The Christian, I believe, stands before the scientist and says, no, you underestimate God's value of man. 
that God created all of that for us. And that's just a glimmer and a hint of how much God ambitions for us. And when he says, do you know how great you are? You as a single individual are greater than all of the billions of solar systems. And so I've made it so big that you can't even comprehend it so that you can begin to recognize that you are so much greater than you po could possibly acknowledge or know. Yeah. Take stock. Take inventory of your own spiritual worth and value, of your own dignity, and do not allow that dignity to be diminished or decreased by anything or anyone ever. Catholic Church has a message, a message that says God loves us with an enormity and an extremity of love, that he created this whole universe for us. And then he said, you know, that's still not enough. I myself will come down and take their form. I will live and walk and speak among them. I will be the one who will give praise to God for them. And I will then join them to me in offering a hymn of praise, a sacrifice of praise, in an ongoing way so that all of creation can find a suitable voice in the God-man, giving praise and worship to God. Every time I have confirmations, I'm privileged to do confirmations often, there's a renewal of baptismal promises. And at the end of the renewal of promises, there's this little phrase, which is so beautiful. This is our faith. This is the faith of the church. We are proud to profess it in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Joyfully proclaiming the faith which we know and love, and which we are convinced is really the good news, which those who live in darkness, that it is good news that those who live in darkness and the shadow of death desperately need to hear, and even without knowing it, they too want to hear it. Live lives resplendent in faith, hope, and charity, so that you may proclaim boldly and proudly that faith of the Catholic Church, which is given to you in baptism, renewed every Easter in the renewal of baptismal promises, and which we ought to be able to proclaim you know, with the Church. This is our faith. This is the faith of the Church. We are proud to profess it in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Good to be with you. Thank you, Your Excellency, for a wonderful presentation, for uh, traveling all the way out here from California to be with us. Um, just a couple of, of quick thoughts and, uh, and announcements for you. St. Ignatius tells us that where the bishop is, let the people gather, just as where Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. And no, that's not a medieval quote. It comes from the early 2nd century. Uh, a disciple of St. John himself. Where the bishop is, let the people gather. And I'm so proud to introduce to you, Your Excellency, the Institute of Catholic Culture. I'm so proud of the people that are here tonight. You come so faithfully to learn the truths of the faith. Sometimes when it's snowing, raining, it's dark out, it's cold out, it's easier to stay home. But I am inspired in my vocation as a deacon by looking over this crowd of people, a growing crowd, hungry to learn the faith so that we don't keep it to ourselves, but that we can go out and do, uh, as the good bishop told us tonight, to bring that burning fire of Christ to the world. Um, so I, we thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, I will also say how touched I was by his comment that he's leading a group of people through the catechism. This is what we need in the Catholic Church 
as uh, many of you received a letter from Bishop Morlino this week, it's sitting on your chairs, with a quotation that I had also sent out to you, uh, saying it's time that we stop talking about education in the Catholic Church, it's time we stop having meetings about education in the Catholic Church, and it's time we actually start doing education in the Catholic Church. Thank you, Pope Francis. And, uh, and I, when, when you said the, you're with the 400th paragraph of the catechism with this group, we need more priests and bishops leading programs on the teachings of the church in the Catholic Church. Amen? Yes. So we thank you. We thank you, Your Excellency, for doing that. Thank you for your talk tonight. My question is, how would you explain to someone that God does exist? How would you explain? Thirty seconds or less. Ex <laughs> 30 seconds or less. <laughs> the standard proofs of the existence of God are, you know, are logically compelling, and at least you can help them raise the question of uh, where do you think this came from? How did how did it begin? And even if they're pure rationalists, they have to acknowledge that things have a beginning. You know, and as I tell people, if there was a bowling ball, and we did that in the seminary one time, we rolled a bowling ball down this long corridor at, Holy, at uh, St. Thomas Seminary. I didn't do it. I, I just rumbled past my door. <laughs> but no one would think, seeing that bowling ball, that, gosh, isn't that amazing? The bowling ball kind of was sitting in the corner, and it just decided to roll down the hall. You know, we knew someone caused it to roll down the hall. So, you know, that basic unmoved mover philosophy. The other thing, and it really has to do with these five transcendentals that Father Spitzer talks about, love, truth, goodness, beauty, being, that there is innate within us this longing for ultimate, unconditional, absolute love, truth, goodness, beauty, being. And ask me, where do you think that comes from? Because if there is not God, then as I told someone, we're, we're the product of pure evolution, which means we are nothing more than mud, a great deal of time and chance. And I would like to think that most people would say, you know, that's the alternative. Either God is, or you are mud, time, and chance. Which do you choose? That's the short answer. How's that? Uh, we have a uh, uh, message coming in from online from Mario, writing in Silver Spring, Maryland. How many here are from Mar uh, Silver Spring, Maryland tonight? I would have guessed there would have been a few people, because it's within driving distance, Mario, and you should be here. <laughs> So Mario, you should have been here. <laughs> uh, I'm going to edit his question a little bit, but he basically asked if, if Vatican II, if one of the f fruits of Vatican II, or one of the things Vatican II called for, was for the laity to become engaged in evang evangelization, why hasn't that actually happened, and what do we do about it? How do we get Catholics to actually understand that we're called to evangelize our secularized culture? Because well, we basically failed at it. I would say it starts with reading some of the documents of Vatican II firsthand as opposed to commentaries on the commentaries. So the original sources are always uh, very, very important. And secondly, I, I, you know, in this I have to blame you know, myself and my brother bishops and fellow priests um, that we really had an obligation at the outset to have catechetical endeavors such as this with a clear and substantive teaching on what was it that the Second Vatican Council said. But as it was, we had a group of very active, energetic souls who, to use a, a farm analogy, that got the bit in their teeth, you know, and just ran and set a course in a direction which is not really clearly the central core, in my understanding, of the Second Vatican Council. And yet it was prominent and prevalent, and there was this press to get more people in the sanctuary. You know, and once that was upside down, it never really got itself corrected. So we have to start afresh, hopefully now, <laughs> to take a look at what is the meaning and value is telling people driving over, of a diocesan finance council, of a parish finance council. What does that mean? That's a proper role for the laity to exercise some kind of role in a parish in helping to oversee finance, to be a member of a pastoral council of the parish. What does that mean? 
you know, we have to really study and engage the whole parish in a process of discerning and studying, you know, that it means not only looking at what happens in the sanctuary or planning the liturgy for Christmas and Easter, but rather, what are we doing in our local community? Where are the pockets of homelessness? Where are the pockets of poverty? Where are the pockets of need? Where are the pockets in, of evangelization? Where are the neighborhoods that really have people who are disenfranchised from the church that we need to reach out to and to have the laity engaged in that? But that takes, it takes an awful lot of work because as priests and bishops, we are engaged in kind of keeping the lights on. Yeah. And so we get focused there, and you get focused in your lives. We have to recognize that despite having those focuses, we also have to do the outreach which the gospel calls us to. You notice he mentions the fault of the bishops and priests, but not the deacons, of course. <laughs> the deacons. I want to make that clear. G given the fact that over 50%, or at least 50% of the Catholic votes go to uh, pro-choice candidates and the like. Do you think the church has a responsibility to make it very clear who is a Catholic and, and what a Catholic, uh, to, to remain part of the church, what their responsibilities are? And, and that goes for politicians too. We have politicians who call themselves Catholics, but they support everything, but, and, and, and everyone seems to go along with it. The media, but mm -hmm. where's the voice that says, you're not that, you're not a Catholic? Trying to define you know, what are the parameters for where Catholicism starts and where it stops, you know, because it, it, it does entail care for the poor as, you know, in addition to care for life. Right? And so that consistent ethic has to be there, and, and we have not done a good job of really categorizing or stratifying to say, but wait a minute, life is, a, is the most precious gift. So really life comes first, you know, and all these other things kind of funnel down below that. I think the bishops are clearer and clearer in faithful citizenship. That document, in my view, improves every time it's, it's re reissued and restudied and a clearer, greater clarity. But there is a sense that somehow it's the bishop's responsibility to you know, tell individual politicians, well, you're not Catholic or, you know, we, I'm going to tell my Catholic people they can't vote for you. I don't know that that's a role that I want to be able to, to take on because that puts me in, in the situation of a judge. And boy, that's just going to backfire very, very quickly. I think the church is clear. The Catechism of the Catholic Church has been out there since 1993. It's not a new document. It tells us what our church teaches and it tells us what the truth is. And it tells all of the Catholic voters you know, who elect, you know, these public officials to represent them, all of the Catholics of, of our churches, of our dioceses, of our nation, need to step forward and say, wait a minute, is God really first, foremost, and central in my life? And are the principles of God something that I really hold to and maintain fully? But if we start pointing, condemning finger, fingers at folks, you know, gosh, I, I'm not sure that I want to have my faults and flaws and shortcomings exposed or challenged or questioned publicly um, because that we are all sinners we're all wounded and Pope Francis has a, a wonderful style and way uh, sort of engaging those that maybe felt alienated before and maybe just maybe he will engage them in a conversation and maybe his methodology will trigger their consciences in an appropriate way so that they engage the gospel more fully and fruitfully in, in their lives. Every one of us, every one of us needs to be converted and changed in terms of our approach and attitude. And I don't know about you, but I, I know I am very self-serving, you know, and I do care about what's good for me. And so when you look at even politicians, Unfortunately, most people say, well, gosh, I'm coming up on 65. I want that Social Security person to be the one who's going to vote for something for me. You know? And all of a sudden, my self-interest maybe takes a front seat to the pro-life interest. The sin is in all of us. Huh? The propensity to choose a personal benefit here and now over a longer-term goal? You know, are we really willing to sacrifice ourselves 
for the sake of the gospel. We have to be willing to do that. That's what a witness is, after all. A witness is uh, the English translation of the Greek word martyr. Yeah? We've got to be martyrs, willing to die to ourselves for the sake of the gospel. We have another message coming in from, from Kathleen in Michigan asking, how do the sacraments fit into this whole scheme of evangelism, understanding of evangelization and combating secularism? Well, the sacraments certainly take place within the context of the church, and, and they are the ongoing s mission of Christ because the sacrament of baptism were initiated into the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. By penance, we are converted, raised to spiritual life again. By confirmation, we're strengthened just as the apostles were in the sacraments, and particularly the Eucharist. We meet Christ, the living God, just as the apostles met him, and we're challenged to follow him and establish that personal relationship with him. Certainly the sacrament of marriage, that sacrament of covenanted love between a man and a woman, which is a graced uh, moment that God guarantees to couples the grace that they need to live out that sacramental marriage, witnessing to the love that Christ calls us to manifest to everyone and the grace of holy orders, certainly guaranteeing that Christ in the sacraments is always present with us. The priesthood exists for the sake of the people of God. And in fact, one of the uh, definitions, one of the priests of my diocese said, you know, one of the, if I was to measure the fruitfulness of, of any activity and maybe the fruitfulness of the Second Vatican Council, is that if the level of sanctity of the people of God raised to such an extent that there was no shortage of vocations to the priesthood and religious life, which would spontaneously spring from those lives which are really resplendent with faith, hope, and charity. Now, if we have that, and the sacraments certainly foster that, can't really go to holiness without penance. You, know, you just can't get there. Penance is so critical for our own sanctification, and if we're not becoming saints, then we're probably sliding downhill and getting further away from God. So the sacraments are our intimate connection with God, God's ongoing ministry in our midst. Short answer to a long question. Read the catechisms, the whole section on sacraments. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Bishop Asha. Thank you very much. I... I know some of you had a, f a few questions, um, and, you're, and he can't leave until I leave, so you're more than welcome to come up and ask him one-on-one uh, -on -one if you would like, but I'll leave you with this thought. Um, I asked you to stand up at the beginning to talk to the person next to you, because encountering our society and making a difference with the problems we face is a matter of actually going and confronting it. And thinking about it is a start but it's not actually going to have any effect until we talk to the people who we know, who we come into contact with on a daily basis. We have been given a great gift by God. Go out there and do something about it. And you say, how, Deacon Sabatino? I don't care how. Meet them at your coffee social. You meet them in the grocery line. Your identity, your job, number one, is to preach the resurrected Jesus Christ day in and day out, nonstop. And until we start to internalize that and make that our habit, our way of life, then outside is going to continue to get dark and darker in our society. And when we realize that and begin to engage our society, then we will watch as the fire of Christ begins to light our society again. Thank you very much, Bishop Vasha, for being with us this evening. God bless you all. Thank you.